Well, hello, everybody. My name is Joe Lin. I'm the Vice President of Product for Public Sector at Palo Alto Networks. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to have you all join me today for the ATARC Federal IT Newscast. Uh, and with me today uh, as our inaugural guest is Jerry Karen, uh, who is the Chief Information Officer for the Office of Inspector General at the, the Department of Health and Human Services. Jerry, thank you so much for uh, joining me on this podcast. Hey, Joe. Thanks. Happy to be here. Um, so for uh, our listeners who are not familiar with uh, your role uh, and, um, you know, your role within uh, OIG and within HHS, maybe we can start off a little bit and you can tell me about what it is that you do uh, and also how it is that you got here in your career. Yeah, sure. Uh, I like uh, long walks on the beach um, at the night. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> oh, that's not what you were asking. Uh, yeah, so I am the CIO for the Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General, as you said. Uh, so we are a component of uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, as a result of being the OIG, we wholly run our own network um, and, and systems and things like that due to the, the nature of the mission of an OIG. Um, therefore, um, as a chief information officer, responsible for all aspects of IT within the IG organization, uh, modernizing, running the networks and the systems and the services and the endpoints and the help desk and all those wonderful things that come along with all the advantages of being responsible for IT. Got it. Um, it is a busy time these days for CIOs and CISOs just due to the tremendous amounts of IT modernization and transformation, oftentimes being driven from uh, executive levels of government, uh, but also due to just the, num the sheer number of attacks uh, and uh, that, that all networks seem to be facing these days. Um, just in the last year, I think, you know, off the top of our heads, we can name uh, multiple uh, uh, nationwide, worldwide uh, attacks uh, against uh, IT networks, both small and large. Um, and uh, so I imagine that keeps you extremely busy and uh, running on very little sleep oftentimes. Absolutely. There's, there's never an end, um, <laughs> but it keeps me employed. Um, I believe as long, it. As long as I do a good job, hopefully. Um, <laughs> that also keeps me employed. But yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the attacks and, and the things, we, re, we rely on technology more and more in our growing, you know, there's more of a drive to technology. There's more of a drive to modernization. And with those, we got to make sure that we also um, maintain our security and mitigate against those risks. Like you said, that some of those attacks are nation state attacks. Some of them, they're insider. So we have to account for all of those things. We have to also in our modernization is, you know, there's challenges, there's tons of technology and using that as an opportunity to enable our workforce and to better processes and procedures to make their job in life more efficient. We definitely want to make sure that we meet the mission and, and business of our of our, for me, the IG, the IG customers that I support, which is the rest of the IG components that do the audits and investigations and litigation. So one of the, the those, um, those uh, attacks, but also vulnerabilities that really caught the attention of everybody, especially within the last few months. Uh, and these things always seem to happen around the holidays, which is amazing. And, and you know, I'm sure your team appreciates it. My team appreciates it uh, when we have and to- I have uh, a theory have around why that is. Plans. Uh, which begs the question, you know, why, why the timing, but that's a separate conversation. But, um, you know, one of those uh, that really caught everyone's attention and that had everybody scrambling just due to the, the, the pervasive nature of the vulnerability um, were the, 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 was the vulnerability associated with Log4j, right? Um, and so maybe we can start off and, and talk a little bit about how you and your team um, viewed this particular vulnerability, how you guys responded to it. And obviously there was a whole uh, uh, federal government-wide uh, emergency directive associated with that as well. We can get to that in a second, but let's just start there. Um, how did you, when, when you first learned about the vulnerability, um, what was the first thing that went through your head and um, what was the operational plan that you and your team ended up implementing uh, in order to try and address and mitigate this vulnerability? So, yeah, and, and in regards to the timing, um, you know, it's it's pretty much known that you know around the holidays people take off so the that the staffs are lower um so that's a theory um that i have around why it happens around those time frames but yeah so things like the log4j there's there's so there's so many that we've been hit with right across the federal government 
And, you know, so a lot of directives, of course, come down from, from fortunately, DHS um, on, on how to um, go about what, what should be done. And, of course, there's reporting back up. Um, of course, you know, we take, you know, our, our um, marching orders from there um, and down through the agency as well. Um, and, you know, we react. So it was, it's, there's a lot of jumping going on right and when you ask how do i react well first thing i do is i reach for my uh aspirin and you know to get rid of that headache because here we go again and it just seems like one after another um nowadays it's just more pervasive um because technology is really easy for bad guys you know all you need is a laptop and a, and a network and you know they're they're off and running um there's plenty of things and tools that they can use on the dark web it's pretty scary um when you start um uh, folding <laughs> peeling back the onion of um, some of the things that are going on out there. Uh, but definitely, you know, so it, it was a jump and react. And y y we need to make sure when we do this is like we get all the bases covered um, in regards to that. So looking under every stone um, and, and we're doing all this while we're maintaining operations, you know, so the operation still has to go on. And while we're, while we're putting these security fixes in place. So we wanna make sure that, you know, there's minimum disruption to operations, but at the same time, the risk is, is well, if, you know, a malicious activity interferes with operations, then guess what? It's probably gonna be more costly than me doing an interruption to your operations. So there's definitely a lot of um, risk. Um, I, won't, I don't wanna say necessarily on the fly, but, you know, we have to take some um, risk decisions in a more, um, quicker fashion on some of the implementations and things that we have to do as a result of these directives. Um, some of them have to be scheduled. Some of them, it's just like, do it now kind of thing. Um, but, you know, there's definitely a communications. It, it's a lot. I think, you know, I'm, I'm all about basics. It's communications. You know, the technology, yeah, we get the directives. We're told what, how to mitigate against them but we need to be able to communicate and that's up and down. And I think that's the great thing about what DHS does is, is they help communicate. This is what you need to do. Um, and, and that has greatly improved over the years as DHS and CISA um, get these communications out and, you know, reporting up timeframes, things like that. What are the expectations? I, I think that communications has greatly improved and has helped immensely to understand the impact and, you know, basically what the priority is of, of these. So, you know, something like a log4j, huge priority, um, drop all things and, and get at it. Um, but you got, we, you know, we basically uncovered every stone possible to make sure that we mitigated um, to the best of our abilities. Um, so there's, there's always, there's always a vulnerability, right? You know, cause vulnerabilities are until they're known are, are those unknown things, you know? Just because log4j comes out today doesn't mean that it wasn't there and there's not something else that's there, a vulnerability that we don't know about yet. It's just log4j, somebody found out about it and then here's a fix. Um, but, you know, there's other vulnerabilities. So we do our best that we can to, to mitigate against such things. And I think that's the great thing about, you know, zero trust is, is you know, trying to change that culture in that direction. Um, I like to call it, uh, I kind of sometimes refer to it as whack-a-mole. There's a vulnerability, whack. There's a vulnerability, whack. There's a vulnerability, whack. Well, that's not efficient. Let, let's put an architecture and solutions together that better mitigate against protecting our data in the first place and not just be reactionary. So the more we can be proactive, um, the better. Uh, putting automations in place to protect against those things is, is, is a great culture change and, and not being just compliant, but being effective at doing it. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, just in a year and a half, I mean, speaking of whack-a-mole, right, you, you've got um, at least three, four um, really, really high profile attacks, vulnerabilities, um, oftentimes using zero day exploits that people didn't know about, you know, starting in uh, December, 2020, you had the solar winds attack. Then the following March, you had the Microsoft exchange attack. And then obviously with this one, um, uh, with Log4j, um, what are some of the lessons learned along the way? You mentioned, um, you know, being much more proactive, um, yeah. having, um, being more aware, but uh, what were some of the lessons that you learned along the way um, as more and more of these attacks, very, very critical attacks came out? 
uh, a critical vulnerabilities came out using zero day exploits. What were some of the lessons that you learned? Maybe you can unpack that for me a little bit about how you've been able to help at least start the shift um, for the OIG, HHS OIG's office onto a more proactive posture. So yeah, there's a lot of lessons learned. Um, you definitely learned who your go-to people are, who know where things are at, and you need to know where things are at, right? You need to know what your network looks like. You need to know what things you own, what things that you can affect yeah. or not. Um, you need to know what connections you have externally as well, because yeah. you need to make sure that uh, those are mitigated. So I, there's a lot of lessons learned that you can take, but I think just knowing your your network. So having that inventory was very important. It's like, all right, you know, if let's say it was, I'm just going to use an example, not that it was any examples uh, or exchange, for example, right? Where are all the exchange service? Luckily we were in the cloud. Um, so we had no on-premise exchange service, but you know, I've been in agencies where, you know, every location has an exchange server um, due to high bandwidth or low bandwidth, high latency. Um, so, you know, definitely understanding where everything is at, what your inventory is, your software, your hardware inventory is very helpful. Um, having a good plan of who's responsible for the times like these, who, who's collecting the data, who's making sure, you know, like kind of a project manager, to make sure that, you know, have we uncovered everything? Do we have that inventory? Having that punch down list to make sure that everything is done, making sure the good change management's in place because you know, you may make change, these changes on the fly because you're just like, I gotta, I gotta mitigate against this vulnerability. But you know, you made a change. So we still have to document that change because we need to know if something happens operationally, let's say, um, that that change affects later on because sometimes you don't know the immediate. Um, all right, what changed? All right, we made this change. Okay, we can tie it back to that. All right, um, and, and fix those types of things. So really, um, and having good communications. Uh, I can't stress enough on the communications internally and externally, up and down the chain, um, between teams internally is very, very important because you know when, when you're taking these actions, you know you got your operations folks and your engineers you know, helping with the solutions for the operations to deploy. You also have your CISO office or your CISO making sure that you know all the mitigations are in place and reporting back on that. So it's definitely a team effort. Um, it's not it's not a stove piped effort. It's definitely a need for good communications. But yeah, those I mean those are some of the high level lessons learned. Of course, with each one, uh, we could probably get into minutia of, of some of those things um, where where we had challenges. You know, some systems are easier than others. You know, legacy systems. You know, it's like, hey, it's held together with duct tape and bailing wire. Um, I, I'll do this, but I just hope it don't break, you know, kind of yeah. thing. So, and, and I think, you know, with the cloud is definitely, you know, having that vendor communication, understanding, because even though it, it's in the cloud and it's fed ramped and everything, you still have, doesn't matter even if it's a SaaS, you still have a level of responsibility to check all bases because ultimately I'm responsible for any data that I put in the cloud, not the vendor. Um, so I really need to make sure that the proper monitoring and all of that is in place. And I really understand that that's properly being monitored and my, our folks know how to monitor it and we're getting the correct logs, um, which is something, you know, that came out in one of the, um, memos as well is about log retention. And so that's another great effort. And so, you know, working to improve on that as well. So we kind of get a baseline of what normal looks like. And that's not always an easy thing to understand their baseline of what normal looks like on a daily basis. Um, but I think, you know, with um, leveraging machine learning and artificial intelligence, I think that's going to help in the future as we get towards that. I, I'm a small, I, I'm actually a small age uh, component. Um, so, I, you know, with limited resources, it really need to know how to prioritize all of these things as well. Um, and what's the biggest bang for the buck and, you know, making sure that, all right, Less, and what did we take from lessons learned? We went through and we did the log4j. What did we learn for that? What can we do better? So really doing that after action review um, so that the next thing that comes up, you know, we, we can work toward being that well-oiled machine or how can we better leverage technologies or what are some gaps in technologies that we have that could have helped? So definitely that lessons learned and that after action review is important in those situations. Um, there's so much that you've said there that resonates with me, as well as uh, from what I've seen uh, with uh, other uh, government agency CIOs and CISOs as well, um, as they have been trying to respond to these 
uh, vulnerabilities uh, and these types of attacks. Um, you know, the, the one thing that you said is, you know, getting yourself on a proactive posture, uh, which starts with um, being able to have visibility of your network, um, having comprehensive situational awareness, both in terms of your, uh, your overall posture, um, how do you appear on the public internet, what is your attack surface, but also what do you have running inside of your network, what do you have running in third party cloud. Um, being able to do that ahead of time and not scrambling to try to answer those questions uh, when attacks happen, I think is is absolutely key. Um, so, so maybe and, I would, sorry, oh, go ahead, please. I, I was just going to add to that. So, you know, we we were kind of talking about reacting to a vulnerability, right, and 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 doing that known thing. But of course, you know, you can kind of get in. We can kind of get in the discussion on incident response too, right? So, you know, understanding and utilizing those technologies to better help you and automate, you know, for incident response, because, you know, that's one of the things about zero trust, too, which I, I think we'll be talking about a little bit more in, in detail. But, of course, you know, relying on humans to wait for a red blinky light to say, hey, that doesn't look right. Hey, Joe, what do you think? Yeah. All right. Hey, what should we do? You know, uh, and all that time it's taking, you know. Whereas if you had automation, it's like, oh, hey, red blinky light. Oh, all right, it meets this risk threshold. Let's take an action. All right, mitigated. We believe we, we've proved that it's mitigated. And then Joe and Jerry can go and look. It's like, all right, what happened? You know, some kind, something happened, some kind of mitigation. All right, let's go back and analyze what the events were. And then, okay, let's put better automation in place now, um, you know, or better mitigation so that doesn't keep triggering later on and we keep getting that same incident. So, uh, you know, incident response, I think how, how, how these vulnerabilities can help us with incident response is important too. You are on that note, you are in a, a very unique position, right? Where you I'm sure are in constant conversation with other CIOs, both within HHS, but also at other federal agencies. Um, so, you know, everybody is thinking about automation these days, uh, but uh, I think there's still a big question as to how exactly um, or is there a role for automation in all, you know, socks? Uh, and, you know, and I think for, for some folks, uh, the idea of introducing automation is a little terrifying, right? Yeah. Uh, and yet, as you pointed out, I think there are, it, it's almost a necessity, uh, it's a requirement for, for any future network operation, for any future security operation center. Um, so what have you seen in terms of the overall response from your community um, has we have we gotten to a point now where automation is accepted, in fact, as a requirement, or does there conti continue to be a debate? Well, I, I think in some aspects, um, you know, it continues to be a debate. But you know, when I talk about it, basically, I would rather have my human resources dealing with the bigger issues and things like that, right? So the things I can automate, I would like to automate. But however, I don't want it to be that Band-Aid, right? So if I highly automate something, let's say, and it keeps, all right, trigger, fix, trigger, fix, trigger, fix, trigger, fix. There's something systematically wrong if that trigger keeps going off and I keep fixing it. So I'm Band-Aiding it and I'm masking that. There's a really underlying problem. It isn't necessarily an incident. There's actually a problem because this keeps getting triggered. So look into that problem and fix it. So I'm a big advocate of the crawl, walk, run approach. And like, um, so like, if you want to automate something, all right, let's understand, you know, what, what makes sense to automate. Okay, here's the thing that we're going to automate. All right, let's look like, okay, if this happens, this happens, this happens. I think we want this to happen. Okay, what does that look like? Let's get the walk. All right, this happens, this happens, this happens. Boom, this is the trigger that would go. And this is the actions that would happen. Is that what we want to happen based off these factors? Is it? Okay. No, let's refine it, you know, and reiterate it. Okay. Now, once we're comfortable with it, then you run, right? Now let's enforce it. We're not enforcing yet in the walk. We're just seeing this would be the outcome, but, you know, then run. So I'm a big advocate of metho methodically going through that crawl, walk, run. Um, but because I don't want to mask issues or true problems, right? Those are all incidents or events, but you can sometimes mask the true problem. So I want to, I want to be able to address those true problems so that trigger doesn't keep going off because I, I probably have a bigger problem as a result. So um, yeah, I'm definitely an advocate for that crawl, walk, run. I think there's certain places that some, you know, and there's some case by case things that some people have some trepidation around it. Um, but, you know, it's automate where it makes sense. But 
of course, being limited with resources, you know, where I can automate, where it makes sense. You know, I can get the, the smart people, like if Joe was on my staff, you know, all right, here's work with this problem. Don't keep dealing with these little whack-a-mole incidents. Focus on the problem or the bigger issues um, that I can really use my human uh, expertise for. Was, I think that was a recruiting pitch for the HHS OIG uh, uh, SOC, right? <laughs> Great place. Yeah. Um, uh, no, no, that was uh, incredibly thoughtful, Jerry. Uh, incredibly thoughtful response. Um, let's 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 pivot slightly to um, everyone's favorite topic of the day, which is zero trust. Um, and uh, for folks who are listening who are unfamiliar uh, with why zero trust is such a big deal, um, Jerry, maybe you can first start off by talking a little bit about. Um, how you are thinking about what is zero trust and also uh, a bit about um, the OMB memo, the Office of Management and Budget memo that came out uh, that everyone's been talking about, everyone's been thinking about. It's at the top of every CIO's mind, federal CIO's mind, um, you know, commonly known as M2209. Uh, so Jerry, maybe we can start off there, just kind of high level, um, you know, how are you thinking about zero trust and then also, you know, any thoughts that you can offer in terms of the OMB memo? Uh, and, you know, does it go far enough? Does it go too far? Um, not far enough? Um, what are its strengths and weaknesses? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I am a zero trust certified strategist. So I've been doing this for many years. I like to say I was doing zero. I was talking about zero trust before everybody else got cool. Uh, Cause I've been talking about it for so many years. Not as long as a John Kindervat or somebody that's the father of zero trust, but um, you know, it kind of before it really became the buzzword that it is today. And you know, there's arguments, um, whether it's, you know, the right term for it, that irregardless, um, it is the word that we use. Um, and to me, zero trust is all about at the, the end game is protecting data. And, you know, um, the, the, the five pillars are very important. The five principles of zero trust are utterly important. If you go back to Forrester and, and see the, the principles of zero trust, I always revisit those to make sure that we're still in line with when, when I talk about zero trust. But again, it's about protecting data at the end of the day. Now, people have argued with me and, um, you know, they say, well, I really think it's about identity. But Joe, if you were the uh, cybersecurity analyst and I got compromised, probably your first two questions are going to be, what did I have access to? And is there exfil? So what is that really about? That's really about data at that point. Uh, but identity is utterly important. It's one of the five pillars um, in the DHS um, security mo maturity model. So um, you know, all pillars are equally important, basically. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I want to be able to protect my data so that when Joe accesses the data, he knows that it has the integrity. It's there when he needs it and wants it, and this is how he accesses it. So, very important. So. Zero trust is not just about identity, though. It's taken in many other factors. And I like to call it, um, you know, kind of a dynamic risk score or, or, you know, the better terminology that I think um, people are trying to um, settle on is confidence score. So basically that is, okay, Joe, authenticate somehow digitally. I need to be able to proof. And there's different ways that we have to authenticate, right? We have cat and PIV cards. Um, we still have username and passwords out there. We have multi-factor authentication. Those all have different levels of risk. So, so how much do I trust each of those? Um, you know, what is that level of risk? I'm probably going to be much lower level of risk for a PIV or a CAT card than it is a username and password. Um, so definitely, you know, there's a factor. Um, and then, you know, what is your target? You know, what data are you trying to access? So basically, you got to determine that, right? So then how, what kind of devices, how is Joe accessing this information? Is he doing it from a personal device? Is he doing it from a fully managed device? Is he doing it from an on-prem network? Because I have a lot of telemetry on on-prem networks and I have a lot of telemetry on fully managed device. BYOD, not so much, or bring your own device. I might be doing application managed application services. So different level of risk. And based off all these factors and you know conditional access policies from cloud can factor into this. I'm oversimplifying it. But based on this number of factors, all right, Joe wants to access that based off all these factors. Do I let him do that? All right. Yeah. You know, the level of risk is below this threshold. He has full access like he would normally um, been given. But if you reach a certain threshold, I may only give you read only because maybe it's a BYOD device and I don't have a tolerance for a BYOD device to have you full access, but I have enough tolerances for you to read or, hey, Joe, you are on a uh, 
personal device that you know this manufacturer shall never touch or data, um, you are off. Another another pillar that I didn't mention in that whole thing is I, I keep reminding people, and I think it doesn't get talked enough. People kind of migrate to devices is the application pillar, and I advocate you know yes devices are important as well. However, the application in true form, if Joe is accessing data, there's an application that's actually facilitating access to that data. Application needs to sit on a device or live on a device, but the application is actually facilitating access to the data. So um, security around applications is very important as well. What's the state of that application? And then all again, all these factors add up to that confidence score based off your target valuation. And then what do I or don't I let you do as a result? So, um, as far as, oh. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I think this is no. exactly where you're going, but uh, yeah. as far as the memo goes. Yeah, so yeah. I was actually gonna start at the executive order, which says strengthen the nation's cybersecurity. And there's a big aspect of zero trust in there. Um, and I, I, I talked about this yesterday as well. And it says strengthen the nation's cybersecurity. And I think to me, that word means a lot because um, my opinion in the federal government, we're kind of compliance focused, right? Um, you know, we have the NIST 853 controls, which is great. And I'm not saying anything bad about compliance. Compliance does have its place. Don't, don't get me wrong. But when you say strengthen, I think of being effective at cybersecurity, not just complying. So complying is, Joe, you, must, you have a system, you must provide authentication. Well, Joe, you, hey, I did username and password. I'm compliant. That's not effective. If anyone thinks username and passwords are effective, you know, we have a problem um, because we've seen username and passwords frequently get brute forced attack, you know, and things like that. So definitely, you know, I, I applaud the EO uh, for saying strengthening because yes, I, I definitely agree. We need to strengthen, which, you know, pushes me towards being effective. So as far as the memo, uh, OMB M22-09, another great thing, right? Really helping prioritize zero trust again. So that's the other thing about the EO. It's not just to the IT folks, it's to the agencies. Hey, prioritize this. This is important for the federal government. This is very important, not just making an IT thing. Now, when it comes to the memo, some great things out of that memo, but it will say in the memo, this isn't the be all end all of zero trust. This is a journey. It's a multi-year effort. It's an architecture. It's a framework. There's a bunch of concepts that all have to integrate together and work together. And then the memo points out certain specific things to be able to do. And I think they help build a foundation for some of these agencies that may not have those things done um, and to build off the other things outside of the memo to reach a true zero trust. So in that in that aspect, I applaud both of them. I think they're great to move us towards that thinking. Now it's easy for folks to, you know, human nature is right. You're comfortable with what you know. And this is a culture change. It, it really is. So yeah, a lot of the concepts are the same, least privilege, you know, right access to the right data, the right people, the right time. That's least, you know, that's kind of talking about least privilege. Uh, we talk about segmentation, you know, we've been doing network segmentation forever um, kind of things. And, but, you know, historically we've, you know, you go to an IT shop and they're kind of done in silos in, in a way, right? You know, the, I, the, the network people do their security. Uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, the identity people do their security. This all has to work together to do that dynamic risk scoring like I was talking about, um, where you're taking in all these factors, not just identity. All right, I checked who you are, have a nice day. I'm taking into the state of the machine. Where are you coming from? And I think the other thing is, is, you know, is data mapping. You know, what does the data flow look like? Is this application sharing information with this application? Is that right? What does normal look like? having that baseline of your data flows. And I'm not saying network mapping, I'm saying data mapping, um, big difference. Your data, be your network becomes basically more of a transport at this point, right? It's not the enforcement that we've kind of looked to the network to be, but it's becoming more of a transport. We're moving our protections closer to those more important data. I like to use the example of the crown jewels versus the cafeteria schedule or the bologna sandwich. I, bologna sandwich, eat the one, um, cause it's lunch, I'm hungry. Um, but you, know, you want to make sure you, at all costs, your crown jewels are protected. If those get lost, there's no replacing them. 
But, you know, if somebody steals my bologna sandwich, there's plenty of bologna and bread in the world. I'll remake another sandwich. But do I care that it gets stolen? Yeah, I'm a little upset, right? But I want to be able to turn. Are my crown jewels still protected as a result of that? So moving our, moving our protections closer to those things that are more important. All data is not created equal. So even going down into the database segment and doing data segmentation within databases, you know, there's some information that I don't mind the federal, the public to have, but you know, that same database may have more important information that I want to segment within the database, not create different databases and then different systems, which now I'm getting overly complex. So I like to keep zero trust simple too, because I got to sustain it at the end of the day. So don't overcomplicate it. Um, so definitely um, it's, it's, it's a step in the right direction. And I applaud it because I've been an advocate for this for many years. Um, when I first started hearing the term many years ago, um, and you know, I actually put a, I got a plotter sized paper and it's like, cause I got frustrated. It's like people were talking about zero trust and then they talked just about identity. It's like, no, it's more than that. Um, or yeah, we just segment the network. No, it's more than that. So I got on a plotter size to put on a table. It's like, you want to talk about zero trust. It's got to be everything on here. Um, but you know, the result of the federal government, you know, having an EO, um, understanding that there's a different need in the way we do cybersecurity, I, I I think they're they're both of those steps forward are great um, in putting us in the right direction. Now we're all going to struggle. Uh, we're all in different places with the technology we have um, and and the journey that it takes to get from here to there. Um, but you know, there's plenty of working groups. I chair the the working group at ATARC, for example, um, which is helping host this today. Uh, we have a zero trust working group. We have um, many government participants. We have about 20 plus in there, as well as we have, um, I think, upwards from between 50 and 60 vendors participating and showcasing their solutions based off the use cases we provide them. Um, there's also a lot of other working groups as well that are out there. Um, so we're all on this journey in some form or fashion. I am a big advocate of just don't make it an IT problem. Um, I'm, you know, enlisting the help of my users. So like if Joe was my user, Joe, what data is important to you on your daily basis? What do you need? How do you work with it? And how do you want to access it? Now I ask, how do you want to access it? Because I want to take advantage and modernize the way you work at the same time and build that into my zero trust strategy and my zero trust requirements. So, you know, not just how you work, but how do you want to work? So I can build that in and make it more adoptable for my end users. Cause yeah, things are gonna change for them. And, you know, I have to support their mission. So I gotta build those things in. So them definitely being, I call them becoming part of the team. And so I can build those personas and get the understanding so I can support their mission going forward. Oh, that was a lot. <laughs> Jerry, uh, you've been so generous with your time. Um, before we wrap up, uh, one last question for you. Uh, sure. Which is that uh, if you could be a uh, federal CIO or CISO for a day, if you could wave a magic wand or just be king of the king of federal CIO for the day, um, what would be uh, an additional change that you would like to make to how the federal government uh, thinks about IT, thinks about security, um, if you could just, you know, wave a magic wand to make that happen? Oh, so many things, so many, so little time. Um, so what the thing that comes top to mind to me is like I said, I think there's a place for compliance. We have Fatara scorecards, there's the FISMA, there's 853, you know, that we um, apply or use to apply the controls based off the level of our system. There's a lot of good documents out there, but what I would like to see is a better way, because as we go through zero trust, how do we measure the effectiveness? Not just the compliance, but better be able to actively measure effectiveness of our cybersecurity. How are we going to go about doing that? Now we have pen test teams and we have blue teams and some organizations or an organization like me, I have to probably contract it out because I don't have a dedicated team like some of the bigger agencies. That's resource intensive. And, you know, it's a snapshot in time still. Um, you know, I want to be able to do ongoing authorization, which I think Zero Trust helps with, but not just be compliant with the with those controls, but are they being effective? How can I ensure and measure the effectiveness of, of my cybersecurity in an ongoing fashion, not just a snapshot in time I, on a daily basis? Yeah, I can look at logs and things like that, but still there's that measurement of how are we being effective? So 
I, you know, having an EO, having the memo and pushing everybody towards zero trust, how do we measure that effectiveness of how people are doing? So that's something, um, you know, that, that I bring up uh, frequently is how do we measure, better measure effectiveness and not just compliance? Love it. Um, well, Jerry, uh, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, thank you all so much for listening in. Uh, again, this is the ATAR Federal IT Newscast, uh, keeping US federal agencies ahead of the latest vulnerabilities. I wanna thank you all for joining me uh, and uh, stay tuned for the next episode. Uh, have a great day, everybody.